Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last lecture of the year uh, in the series. Um, for those of you taking the class after I introduce our speaker today, uh, I'm going to pass the sheet around. Make sure that you sign it up, and whoever signs it up last, um, hand me the sheet so that you get credit for being here. And speaking of our speaker today, our speaker is Soraya Murray from UC Santa Cruz. She's assistant professor in film and digital media in that department at Santa Cruz. She's also faculty in digital arts and new media, known as DANUM, and the MFA program um, Art and Design Games and Playable Media. So there's several, uh, several programs going on uh, at Santa Cruz uh, for people who are interested in game studies. Uh, Soraya, it happens, uh, has an essay in a series that I edit uh, in a book called Zones of Control, edited by Kirschenbaum and Harrigan. I just wanted to flag that because I feel a little bit of uh, ownership over that. But more important, she's got a book coming out soon with Taurus, I believe, called On Video Games, The Visual Politics of Race, Gender, and Space, which sounds a lot like her topic for today, which is on the visual politics of video games. Soraya Murray. Thank you. Thank you so much to Henry for this kind invitation and to Ingmar, who I'm told is not able to be here today, but um, who's greatly um, assisted in coordinating, and also to Peter, who's hosted me. Um, so what I'd like to do today, can you all hear me in the back all right? You're good? Okay. So what I would like to do today is, um, well, first I'd like to actually know, um, are all of you um, computer scientists? What are you, uh, are there any arts people here? Are there any visual studies people here? A little bit? So um, the way that I've geared my talk today is I'd like to introduce you to my critical project, which is my book, which is coming out hopefully around the end of August. Um, and I would like to kind of talk to you a little bit about what's at stake in this kind of a project, um, go over um, some of the sort of key ideas um, of it, and kind of think about some scholars who I'm really interested in and excited about in terms of bringing the discussion of culture in a really in-depth, meaningful way to games themselves. Um, so. Uh, what I will do is I'll just, uh, I will go ahead and discuss like some of these key figures and how they kind of intersect with my project. Um, afterwards, I hope there'll be time where we can really talk together a little more in depth about maybe um, particular games and things like that that I find like really exciting uh, today. So video games are certainly a pervasive form of mass media and they now shape the way that people ascribe meaning to their world and so I think it's very safe to say now that games simply are culture. Like music, literature, television, fashion, and film, games as culture constitute uh, what one scholar uh, talked about as networks of meaningness, which individuals and groups use to make sense of and communicate with one another. And I'm thinking here about Stuart Hall, who is, I mean, basically one of the founders of cultural studies. Um, he was a cultural theorist and sociologist and was very interested in not necessarily always looking to the high to understand culture, but thinking about the everyday, the popular, the low, the denigrated, and how it spoke to culture as well. So my interest in games is rooted in a cultural studies and visual studies approach. So cultural studies utilizes an interdisciplinary toolkit borrowed from sociology, history, literary theory, political science, uh, among many other fields. And one of cultural studies interventions was to erode the barrier between the high and the low and to mobilize a very deep analysis of the popular, the everyday, and to reveal the workings of power within um, culture um, as they were manifested in these kinds of representations. And to see, I mean, I think it was very important as well that Stuart Hall talked about the ways in which it was possible to find um, avenues of resistance within those representations them themselves as well. So Stuart Hall, whose name is synonymous with cultural studies, was director of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham from 1968 to 79. And he's widely considered to be one of the cultural studies founders, founding fathers, and certainly its most iconic voice. So um, I think about his work in my own. Um, and as another scholar wrote of Stuart Hall, for him, for Stuart Hall, culture is not simply something to appreciate or study. It is also a critical site of social action and interpretation where power relations are both established and potentially unsettled. And I think that potentially unsettled part is something that I'm very interested in. Okay, so I'm also interested in visual studies. 
uh, which is connected to the project of cultural studies and was engendered basically by our history's disciplinary unwillingness to open itself to new genres, to material culture, to the popular and to the global, right, in terms of its study. So my background is actually in art history, but I gravitate toward the low, the popular, those things which might fall out of the proper study of art history. So as quintessential forms of visuality within a 21st century context, defined by political, cultural, and economic conflicts. Games both mirror and are constitutive of larger societal fears, dreams, hopes, and even complex struggles for recognition. So utilizing various games as focused examples of what I call playable representation, because it is important to me to think about the fact that you do engage with these things. So it's not exactly the same as looking at a film or reading a book, like it has certain different functions um, that act on uh, the player in different kinds of ways. Um, I think about the ways that we can unpack games for their complex significations. So this constitutes part of a much larger examination of games as culture, modeling a critical approach that fully embraces them as operating at the front line of power relations within dominant culture. So, my interest in this subject uh, started back in the early 2000s, actually, when it was not really viable for me to do it as a part of my actual dissertation. But um, nevertheless, it, it piqued my interest because I was hearing all of these things about this terrible game where you could um, drive around and you could sleep with a prostitute and then you could take her money, you could hit her over the head and kill her and then get back in your car and do more mayhem elsewhere, right? This, of course, is Grand Theft Auto. GTA 3 came out during that time. Um, there was a lot of negative press around it. There were also really significant um, cultural uh, representatives, such as Ebert, Roger Ebert, the famous film critic, who said things like, games will never be art, right? So early on, um, while I was starting to get a PhD in art history at Cornell University, I was kind of suddenly faced with this kind of closedness, right, to a very new and important form of visual culture. And so I looked at it myself, and although I couldn't really do it officially in the capacity of my um, PhD studies, I kept an interest in games, and uh, I went out and I bought a PlayStation 2, and I, um, I bought Grand Theft Auto, even though I was a broke graduate student, and I played it myself, and I realized that it was very, very different than the way it was described. And so um, the first essay I ever wrote on games, which is freely downloadable if you're interested in reading it later, is called High Art, Low Life from 2005. And uh, I talk about Grand Theft Auto, Vice City, and San Andreas, thinking about the ways in which the aesthetic, the immersive aesthetic experience actually gives rise to much more complex engagement than mass uh, media would have you think, um, that these games are actually extremely complex. Um, they have a convincing sense of time and place. There's, a, you know, there's just a lot going on in them. And that they also function as satire, right? that these games function as satire, and if we don't recognize them as satire of American culture, then perhaps it's simply because we resemble it too much, right? So, so um, that was my first essay, um, arguing you know, against this kind of position um, where he says, you know, for most gamers, video games represent a loss of those precious hours we have available to make ourselves more cultured, more civilized, and more empathetic. So I was kind of coming out against this position. So when we look at a game like Grand Theft Auto 4 from 2008, and we look at the figure of Nico Bellic, um, an undocumented immigrant, basically, who's trying to get a foothold on the good life, um, we understand this as a complex satire of this mythology, right, in America, in terms of making it, you know, uh, on your own honest way, and coming up in America if you can only just innovate your way through that, right? So these are the kinds of things that interested me at first. So my book is called On Video Games, The Visual Politics of Race, Gender, and Space. And today, I really want to talk to you about that project, um, which has been a project that came out of many years of teaching a games course called Video Games as Visual Culture, which slowly grew from a relatively small course, like 100-ish people, to now it's ballooned up to about 375 people. Um, it's taught every year at my institution. And it's intended to understand games as a form of visual culture. Right. Um, so I do not teach people how to make games. I do not teach people how to make better games or how to innovate 
new platform design or anything like that. We just really sit with these incredible things as cultural production and think about what that means. Okay, so in this book, which is forthcoming, I think about things like um, a consideration of the function of cultural studies and visual studies and how a very neoliberal turn in the nation, and I would argue also internationally, has cast a shadow across the possibility of thinking of games in the same conversation as cultural analysis. I think about them as technological objects, but not exclusively so. I think of games as visual culture and how um, there have been some seminal texts, some of which I, I will uh, share with you today, that discuss this topic, but in effect, in a cultural moment in which games come into being, um, we have expanded neoliberal economic values. Um, I focus specifically in the case of my book on cases um, in the post-Obama, post-9-11 moment um, within a United States context, mostly games that many, many Americans play, although not all the games are American right, products. Um, and I think about certain key questions. One of the key questions I ask is, is the culture in game culture the culture of cultural studies, right? Are these things the same, right? Um, so when the term game culture is used, it typically refers to something that we might think of as player culture or fan culture, um, which is in keeping with a common definition of culture as something that concerns the particular ways of life, the attitudes, and the customs um, of a particular social group, right? But it is thought of as something predominantly separate still from culture at large. So um, game scholar Adrian Shaw talked about the ways in which popular discourses still, quote, define game culture as something very distinct and very different from mainstream US culture, end quote. So games as culture and the potential of a critical game studies is desperately actually needed as an expanded understanding of what culture actually means in relationship to games, uh, its scholarship, its criticism, and one that actually accounts for the intellectual interventions of cultural studies and particularly um, its crucial visual component, which is called visual culture studies, right, or visual studies. So this would allow for a much more complex um, uh, consideration of the, exp like an exploration between uh, identity, representation, ideology, and power. And so I argue in my book that this gulf between video game culture and the culture of cultural studies is actually constructed, it's highly illusory, and it's also highly intentional. So games are these contradictory objects that invoke both the spaces of possibility and extreme capitalist mass production, right? So games are this quintessential visual culture of advanced capitalism, and yet as visual studies scholars, we're not really doing our job in thinking about these objects at, in this way. So a lot of popular discourse actually spends a lot of time thinking about and dedicates a lot of energy to thinking about um, games as unimportant and what you would call low, right? So this line of logic denigrates gamers as engaged with trivial child's play and frames games as morally vapid and even corrupting of youth or inducing violence. We've all heard these stories, right? So mounting critiques of the games industry's disproportionately high incidence of workplace chauvinism compared to many other professional spheres have recently caught the attention of the mainstream press and the big kind of explosion that kind of slopped over into the mainstream press uh, that you may remember from recently is Gamergate, right? This um, harassment campaign um, against the presence of women and other socially defined minorities and progressives um, that painted a kind of bleak image of the state of game culture um, in-game representations, and also the game industry's politics of exclusivity, right, on the, the level of the actual industry. So the debate around Gamergate be became so vitriolic at one point, um, I'll come back to this, it became so vitriolic at one point that the conventional construction of the gamer, right, as an identity, which is associated with a particular kind of white, male, disengaged, or anti-social player was declared dead by several critics. So this is a flurry of articles that actually came out um, almost on the same day um, that talked about this like notion of the gamer as dead, like as a dead concept. 
So one of the things I talk about is just this idea that Gamergate was a kind of paradigmatic eruption of something that would normally um, remain hidden, but is actually pervasive, right? It made, it put into public view uh, the normally hidden identity politics at play in dominant games, right? Certain people wanted to keep games for themselves in a particular kind of way and for them not to change. And this was an eruption of a kind of um, culture war, right, that was occurring, um, uh, but which was not really in the mainstream at that time. Okay. So during a 2014 interview, Anna Everett, who's a very um, important uh, media studies scholar who's been writing about games and race for a very long time, actually, described the persisting resistance to speak on race, gender, and identity politics, saying, quote, racial and gender assumptions will uh, still operate as functional structuring presences underlying many of games' procedural rhetorics and tropes of mastery, end quote. Um, Lee Alexander, who actually wrote an article explaining what Gamergate was for Time Magazine, which was kind of actually shocking at the time, the idea that it was pr published in Time Magazine, um, described the incidents that had occurred as evidence of what she called sharp growing pains in the industry, ultimately characterizing the debate as, quote, a tension between games as product and games as culture. So I like the way she phrased this. I think that she astutely gets closer to the core of what I would describe as a politics of identity at play in games. Uh, Adrian Shaw, uh, who's a very interesting scholar as well, um, characterized game culture as particularly masculine, heterosexual, and white, and that games themselves were the least progressive form of media, of a media representation, despite being one of the newest mediated forms. Um, I recommend to you her book called Gaming at the Edge. Um, her focus is really on players and the way players do or don't identify with the characters in their games, and also whether or not they actually feel that they need to, which is interesting. And she did a lot of um, field work on her own to kind of come up with a kind of provisional um, sense of the field of players and what they need, what they say they need. So, um, and I would say that what she says is pretty true, right? In the sense that with very little exception, dominant games present a vision of the world that's devoid of the postmodern, the post-structural, the post-colonial, the feminist, the queer, or any other critical cultural intervention. Um, so meanwhile, they're massive, they're pervasive, they're extremely lucrative economic ventures enjoyed by a wide variety of people. There are lots of statistics coming out every year about who plays. The notion of who plays is actually quite different than the reality, right? People think of pimply teenage boys, right? But the reality is actually quite different now. The average game player is, what, 35, 37-ish, right? Um, that half, and also according to the Nielsen 360 Gaming Report, in 2016, quote, half of the population in the world's industrialized countries now identify as gamers, right? So this is not something that visual studies can ignore. So the increasing presence and consumer power also of women and people of color in games is likely connected to a sense that something's being lost, right? A common woe of Gamergate supporters. And this sentiment echoes a broader sense of anxiety in the United States regarding larger demographic shifts and the kind of scare articles around how um, uh, the majority will soon become the minority, that, um, that the, uh, the white majority in this country will become impendingly uh, minority status uh, by the year 2041. These, these numbers are contested, of course, but these are the kinds of articles that are circulating. So I operate from the base assumption that all games engage in a politics of identity, not just some of them. It should be understood that the perceived neutrality of games, even those that don't purport to deal with issues of identity, um, traffic in the assumption of a perceived universalism that's actually fictive. So it's never been the case that there was a politically neutral or raceless form of games representation. Rather, it's been the case that a stranglehold has existed, right, on this image-making machine by a very small and privileged constituency of producers who possess this temporary power to displace their own subjectivity as universal, when in fact it's actually not at all and is shot through with the politics of identity. So while this is all going on, right, it's a complicated problem, um, you also have these impacts of 
uh, neoliberal values that strongly shape uh, the space into which video games have come into their mat maturity as a medium, as well as the terms by which their analysis has been integrated into the academy. Um, also, um, I like to uh, not let my um, liberal academic friends sit too comfortably, right? Um, to be fair, the liberal academic pretensions um, exist to also routinely reject video games and especially mainstream games as uh, escapism, militarism, hypercapitalist enterprise, um, and as forms inappropriate to serious consideration, right? So it's very common in liberal institutions to find a lot of technical training on games and very, very little attention to them as forms of visual culture, as culture, and thinking about what they actually mean, right? Um, and this is where, you know, I'm really focused. So liberal progressiveness often performs this kind of disingenuous refusal to deal with video games. And um, this dismissiveness often takes the form of this refusal to actually deal with them, um, to have an overbearing sense of who it is who plays games, what games will make you do, um, and the kinds of negative impacts that they'll have on players in general. And this too stands in the way of thinking about games in a really serious way. All right, so um, there's also hesitancy on the part of academics to think of it as a legitimate object of study because of their connections to capitalism, associations with escapism, and the sense of low culture, and the sense that it's a debased form of mass entertainment, right, that doesn't bring out the best in people. So I question these tendencies in the academy because I feel like this critical neglect also contributes to a lot of pernicious image-making practices um, that are common in games, um, but by passively refusing to engage with games in general, they just persist. Like these very retrograde types of representations that would not be permitted to exist in other forms because there's much more of a critical lens on things like film and literature and television and so on. So, you know, there's moral outrage, but on the other hand, then there's this problem, right, of not really making a serious critical intervention. So I can't really entirely blame the games industry for its illusions and for its shoddy representations, right? When it's simply pandering to audiences and to some degree it is also the fault of people not really uh, putting proper attention on this um, and refusing to intercede on this form that is so ubiquitous, right? But um, as very important scholars such as Lisa Nakamura, whose uh, focus has been on uh, digital media and race generally, um, she rightly indicates, quote, this is precisely the moment for game scholarship originating from ethnic studies, women's studies, queer studies, film studies, and cultural studies to intervene in this ongoing conversation and to strategize about the future of race, gender, and digital media. So um, some of the people I'm really excited about, um, if you're interested in the subject, I'm thinking about um, Adrian Shaw, obviously, who I mentioned uh, Briefly, there are very few game, uh, books on games as culture, but there are a couple. Um, game Cultures that came out in 2006, um, and Tomb Raiders and Space Invaders, Video Game Forms and Context, which came out also the same year. I recommend them to you. They're actually quite good, and they hold up over time. Um, obviously, um, Ian Bogost, um, the Pervasive Games, uh, Persuasive, excuse me, Persuasive Games from 2007 um, is a very important kind of core text for me. Um, that we, we, sorry, that we must think of them as um, persuasive, right? Um, that they're computational artifacts also, that they're not just passive representations, that we engage with them, right? Um, and so we have to actually think about what players do, not just how the game actually looks, right? And I, and I do model this in my own research. Um, this is a very important text as well, Nick dyer Witherford and Greg DePoiter, um, Games of Empire. Um, they uh, follow games from the uh, sort of uh, conception, uh, production through uh, their consumption and uses in culture in a really interesting way um, from a kind of Marxist uh, perspective. Very, um, very strong text. Um, I'm also interested in the work of uh, D. Fox Harrell right now, whose um, book Phantasmal, Phantasmal Media, An Approach to Imagination, Computation, and Expression, um, talks about the connection between games and, uh, you know, as artifacts that contain like social dimensions to them, right? On the on the very level of of 
of code, right, itself. So, um, you know, he's interested in thinking about um, the way in which the social and the cultural work on the production of these kinds of representations. Um, he thinks about the term phantasm specifically, which um, comes from cognitive science, and he thinks about this idea that uh, phantasms are a combination of imagery, which is either mental or sensory, and ideas um, that uh, range from our senses of self to social ills and other everyday experiences, so that um, we understand when we look at something, right, that we realize that we are not looking only at the thing in itself, but a complex web of significations as well, right? Um, and that through the influence of the social and the cultural, right, the mental image that's conjured is more than just that which is simply denoted, right? Uh, Miguel Sicart, also very important, um, thinks about ethics in games, argues that computer games are ethical objects, that computer game players are ethical agents, and that the ethics of computer games should be seen as a complex network of responsibilities and moral duties on both sides, right? So it really activates the potential of the player as well. That players are not merely passive, right? Um, that they reflect, they relate, they create with their ethical minds, and they engage with the system in ways that may not be necessarily always preordained, right? Uh, values at play in digital games, a co-authored text by Mary Flanagan and Helen Nissenbaum, also very important for my work, um, basically thinking about design um, and, uh, and the values that are built into design as it relates to games, and thinking about how values are enacted through the forms of play that are engendered by the rules, right, created in games. Um, of course, Anna Anthropy, um, also called Antipixelante, right, um, a noted critic, freeware game designer, writer, and speaker, who um, has really been in many ways at the forefront of the democratization of games as a form, and advocates for as many people as possible, as many different kinds of people as possible to play games. Um, and then also, this is a brand new text that's just come out, Queer Game Studies, which is an edited anthology. Um, by Bonnie Ruberg, who's on the right, um, who's a new and up-and-coming um, uh, queerness and games scholar, as well as Adrian Shaw, who I mentioned before, in Gaming at the Edge. They co-authored a really interesting text um, on queerness and games from a quite theoretical um, perspective. Okay, so in my book, I think about these games, right? I think about what they mean from a cultural perspective. Um, I focus on mainstream games. I'm really interested in games that lots and lots of people play. And also, um, I bracketed out those games that are like massively multiplayer games because I think there's a critical like sociological dimension to people who are engaging with each other through the medium um, that required a different kind of study than perhaps like visual culture studies exclusively. So in chapter one, I focus on racial difference and diversity and gender bias in the games community through a close reading of Assassin's Creed III Liberation. Who's played this game, anyone? Yeah. Um, a mainstream game set in colonial America that features a black female lead character who fights slavery. Through a consideration of this figure who becomes a cipher for intersecting concerns of race, gender, and sexuality. So this chapter teases out the deep and eruptive figures, uh, effects of such a figure on the established and beloved franchise of Assassin's Creed as paradigmatic of larger industry spasms <laughs> in terms of thinking about um, how it has to relate to its own responsibility in terms of representation. So um, I look at this work thinking about Edward Said and his um, iconic text Orientalism and the connection between the Assassin's Creed brand actually um, with Prince of Persia, right, from whence it sprung more or less. Um, and, uh, and the idea that um, Orientalist tropes, while not on the surface of Assassin's Creed anymore, operate uh, deep uh, below, right, in these very interesting ways. And so in the first chapter, this is what I think of. The second chapter, I think about white normative figures under duress through games that present um, a crisis in American narratives of progress, especially The Last of Us um, from 2013, which is set in a melancholic post-apocalyptic um, United States. 
Um, I read it against um, Spec Ops The Line, uh, also extremely important game that turned its own game mechanics on itself, and I can talk about that a little more later, um, from, two, uh, from 2012, um, where it kind of undermines the authority of the American hero, soldier, super soldier. Um, and I also think about Tomb Raider, the reboot from 2013, um, in which Lara Croft is reimagined in a really interesting way. Um, so I think about these in terms of some of the important work done, both on whiteness studies, but also in thinking of representation um, in terms of gender, um, mostly through the work of Richard Dyer, who's a very important film scholar, um, iconic film scholar, um, particularly his book, The Matter of Images, um, his book, White, and um, some of his other works as well. I look also in the next chapter at uh, landscape as ideology in several games, the primary of which is Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, um, which came out in 2015. Um, so within its spatial features and complex renderings of Afghanistan in the mid-1980s, it's actually set in Afghanistan in 1984-ish. Um, it's the exact um, cited moment in which the Taliban comes into being, um, eventually giving rise to Al-Qaeda. So in this chapter, I kind of think about how the Phantom Pain becomes an extremely complex cultural document of post 9-11 anxieties and entangled US relations um, during the Soviet-Afghan war, which took place during that time and beyond. So I look at that through um, two texts, which I think are really useful. One is an older text called Landscape and Power by W.J.T. Mitchell, um, which talks about the way in which land becomes framed Right, the space becomes sort of framed as landscape and the ideological framework that um, is in, enmeshed in that process. Um, and then also the work of Neda Atanasovsky, um, Humanitarian Violence, in which um, she thinks uh, particularly about the many ways in which the visual culture around conflict um, can produce certain ideological effects. Right? So I think about that and then uh, in my last chapter, I do a comparative analysis, um, turning, instead of to space, I turn to city, right? To, to the development of, city, of cities in games. And I turn my attention specifically to cityscapes, particularly the global megacity, as it is imagined in playable form. So through a comparative analysis of two primary games, one being Max Payne 3 from 2012, which if some of you know this game, it's, um, a very iconic, known, and beloved figure from a noir detective series, which is usually in a perpetually rainy New York, right? Um, but he is, in the third game, um, older, fatter, more alcoholic than ever, and displaced to Sao Paulo, which is very um, disconcerting, I would say, for someone who's played the other games, because it doesn't at all look like um, what the previous games were like. Um, so we have this, um, and then uh, I compare it to Remember Me, which is a slightly, I mean, still a major game, but slightly, uh, I would say, less, uh, lesser known um, game from 2013, um, which presents, I guess you would call it like a sort of Blade Runner inspired um, future dystopia. Um, and I think about and examine the representations of the metropolis through the intersecting vectors of globalization, violence, and constructions of otherness within this. Um, so, yeah, so, um, in Max Payne, we're faced with a Brazilian favela um, and uh, a kind of very uh, phobic kind of representation of the global city. Um, in the other uh, game, we have a representation that's much more um, uh, techno-dystopian, specifically. Um, and it's a future in which the um, mining and sale and trade in memories has led to a kind of erosion, right, of society. I think about this work um, through the lens of a very important scholar who's an urban um, historian. He's an architect himself and a theorist, um, Nazar Al-Sayyad. Um, I look at his book called Cinematic Urbanism, which is a really incredible text. Um, and he poses this kind of interesting question. You know, he says, okay, so what if we think of the cities in films, because he's really focused on films, as 
all we have to go on. Like if no cities existed and all we had were their representations, what would these places be to us? And so I think about this in relationship to the types of things we see in game representations, right? And um, one of his early uh, kind of postulations in his book is that um, he says, I've increasingly come to believe that in our understanding of the city, um, that it cannot be viewed independently of the cinematic experience, right? In a pervasive game of mirrors reflecting each other, art imitates life, life imitates art, art imitates art, life imitates life, right? So I was kind of applying this, right, to a different circumstance and thinking, well, no, games and films, they're not the same thing, right? But we're still trafficking in these very complex representations. What do these representations within games start to tell us about what we fear, what we hope for, what we understand of the city, what we think of the global, right? Um, so for me, you know, what is at stake um, is this idea that games always already traffic in representational struggles and they mobilize forms of difference, right? So understanding visual culture and particularly mass visual culture as a core site of social engineering and political influence, right? Competing constituencies who make and engage with games, both the dominant games and alternative games, now clearly are engaging in this kind of struggle for recognition. So more than merely a kind of deconstruction of problematic image making practices within games or a critique of representations, I'm really interested in this text and unveiling how mainstream games powerfully shape the means by which subjects come to understand their place and possibilities within a given social con context. So representation for me is in fact a kind of front line of power relations and domination within particular spheres of influence. And this is no less true of games than other forms of mass culture and their attendant industries, of course. So this is an urgent problem that I revisit throughout the book that I've written. So my objective in talking about these games is not to simply judge them as good or bad representations, but as a telling response to massive social economic, political, and cultural shifts that are associated with globalization. Ultimately, this text innovates and expands upon um, a kind of critical studies methodology for thinking of games and um, opens up new possibilities that mirrors the expanded makers and players who are participating in this highly sophisticated form of cultural production in the 21st century. So it's actually a really exciting moment in which new young generations of games critics and scholars are making identity-based critiques of representation and beginning to hold both the industry and its ancillary realms like on game, online game communities, games journalism, all of these arenas to a higher standard. But the artificial separation of game culture from the culture of cultural studies poses an impediment to these conversations that are vital for game studies to have in order to really actually have a healthy discourse. So the gulf between the notions that games are the lowest form of low culture and their explosive expansion as a form uh, that is global, right, of visual culture is notable. And therefore, I feel like these moralistic protestations that accompany their presence should be treated with a lot of skepticism. So playable representations matter. Their extremely potent anticipatory images suggest that the tools of cultural analysis are needed more than ever to both unveil their significations within the context of their making and to make sense of what dreams we carry with us into the future. Thank you. So it looks like we have almost 20 minutes and I'm happy to take questions. Also, if you have comments, um, which you would think of later on, I'm very happy to hear from you um, offline. And if you go to my website, which is sarayamurray.com, you can find a few links to very recent articles um, that have come out um, or that are coming out very soon if you'd like to read some of my close analyses of particular games in advance of my book. Do you have questions? Thank you.